And now we're going to move into terminology and its pitfalls. And for this, we have uh, for this session, we have three presentations. And I'm just going to do introductions for Jalen, Kellen, and Emma really quick. Um, so Jalen is an MA candidate in political science at UNC Chapel Hill. Jalen is in the second year of the Transatlantic Master's program. Prior to uh, Prior to the TAM program, Jalen attended UNC for undergrad and served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco. Within the TAM program, Jalen has been awarded the FLAS Fellowship and has obtained the Graduate Certificate in Middle East Studies jointly offered between UNC and Duke University. Currently, Jalen is living in France where he is writing his thesis to conclude his graduate studies. And Kellen. Kellen graduated from UNC Chapel Hill in May 2020. Here, she double majored in contemporary European studies and global studies with a focus on Africa and international politics and minored in French and African-American and diaspora studies. During her collegiate career, Kellen spent a semester in Paris studying um, French and volunteering, served as an agent for social change and became a published author in spring 2020 with an article about women's rights in Tunisia. And then, Emma Sugli, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, is a law student at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, youth fellow at International Youth Think Tank of University of Gothenburg, board consultant at Center for Energy, Environment, and Climate Change, and a research assistant at European Constitutionalism. In a nutshell, she is a human rights and political sciences uh, enthusiast and a debate and public speaking lover. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jalen. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do you want me to share my screen or do you want to share? Okay, you'll share. Okay, so this presentation will pertain to underconsidered topics relevant to contemporary Europe. I will be explaining what goes unexamined and or understudied in the field of transatlantic studies by dissecting the terminology and its pitfalls. Then we can get to the next slide. Okay, so starting with the term transatlantic studies, um, as you can see, trans means across or beyond or through, and then Atlantic means of or relating to the Atlantic Ocean. The term transatlantic studies currently primarily focuses on relations between the US and Europe, more specifically the US, UK, and EU. And that's where I feel the pitfall in the terminology comes into play. So for the pitfall, um, basically, as it says, there's a lack of inclusion of countries along the Atlantic and Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa. The Atlantic Ocean itself extends beyond the US and Europe, yet many of the countries in the regions I just mentioned aren't given much of a focus in the field. So in this field of transatlantic studies, the lack of inclusion of all the countries along or within the Atlantic renders the term Incomplete or misleading, in my opinion. Okay, and hold on. Actually, can I share my screen real quick, Tracy? Okay. Slideshow. Um, okay, share screen. Okay, so in this slide, I like to touch on what I understand to be the beginning of transatlantic relations. As we know, the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus came across the Americas in an attempt to reach India back in the late 1400s. Um, Christopher Columbus made four transatlantic voyages from Europe to the Americas, coming in contact with the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. And as you can see from this map, one of the first places that he came into contact with was actually the Bahamas and in the subsequent voyages, many places through the Caribbean and South America. So Columbus's voyages brought the Americas into the consciousness of Europeans and subsequently led to the colonization of the land, genocide of indigenous populations, the forced migration and human trafficking of enslaved Africans, 
and the establishment of a few settler colonial states. So I'm going to make a notice of this map starting here in Europe. So as you can see, the Europeans would leave Europe, go down to Africa where they would either abduct or purchase Africans and put them into enslavement, bring them over to the Americas, both North Central or both North and South America, including the Caribbean and Central America also. And then they would create or they would work the fields and work the land and get raw materials that would be sold over to Europe where they would be manufactured into goods that would then be brought down to Africa to use as exchanges for a form of currency for more um, Africans to put into enslavement. And the cycle just continued and continued. So I'll give a personal anecdote here as I am living in Europe. So the term transatlantic came into my consciousness during childhood when in school we were learning about the transatlantic slave trade, the triangular trade and middle passage. And now I'm in a master's program for transatlantic studies and it focuses primarily on the US and Europe and UK. So just from childhood, transatlantic to me had always included Africa and South America and the Caribbean. And then now it seems it mostly focuses on just the US, EU and the UK. And uh, yeah, so. I will go on to the next slide. So the voyages of Columbus and the transatlantic trade route are integral, integral parts of transatlantic history. So my question is, how does the current usage of the term trans, transatlantic studies not include a focus on Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa, when these areas were in fact the origins of transatlantic relations? And as you can see here from the map, the countries that are either within or along the Atlantic Ocean stretching from US, Canada, North, and then Mexico, all of Central America, all of um, the Caribbean, and then from the tip of Colombia and purple, all the way down to Argentina here. And then on the other side, the tip of Morocco and brown, all the way down to South Africa. So my suggestions are, I have two suggestions actually to help remedy this problem. And if the field of transatlantic studies is to continue as is with no emphasis on Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa, I suggest specifying the focus of the field by calling it transatlantic studies of the global north, as this would better reflect what the field actually entails as it revolves around countries that are in NATO and or the EU. So as you can see, NATO, I'm sure you've heard a lot of it or a lot about NATO recently in the news, but it entails all the countries that you see here on the map that are highlighted in blue. And then, as you can see here, these are NATO countries, and then these are the rest are EU, and then there's the overlap between them. And this is what primarily transatlantic studies focuses on. And the second suggestion is if the naming of the field of transatlantic studies is to remain as is, I suggest that we broaden the current focus of the field using the existing US and EU institutions. And these institutions responsible for diplomatic services and foreign affairs, such as the US Department of State or the European External Action Service. Um, and we could use these to talk about, well, this could be, this could both retain the original intention of the field to focus primarily on the US and Europe, while still finding a way to include Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa in the field and be true to the terminology behind the word transatlantic. And for example, we could discuss things like, what are the contemporary cultural, political, social, and economic relations between a US or an EU country with one of the countries throughout Latin America, Caribbean, and Africa through the lens of the American and European institutions that I mentioned earlier. And that will be all for my presentation. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jalen. I think that's something we always just kind of assume and never really question. And so I think by bringing that up, that's um, it's a really good point and makes you think a little more about how we really conceptualize things and where that stems from. And now we are going to move to Kellen's presentation.
Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm trying to see my slide on the. Do you not see it? Um, I see it at the top, but for some. Um, I don't know why. It's like at the top of my screen, so it's like really small. Um, Can everyone else see it? Oh, okay, okay. I, I, I was able to do it. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's wrong. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay, can I start? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Callan Robinson, and today I will be presenting on white lash behavior in Europe. Next slide. So my thesis is that the crisis of anti-Blackness plaguing 21st century Europe is no novel predicament, but is rather one that is in parallel with the past. In this presentation, I will argue that white lash is a frame that can be used to explore both historical and current conditions in Europe. And, that, and then this frame is gonna be used in this presentation specifically in regard to society's reaction to Black presence. Before delving into the intricacies of this subject, I'm going to define some terms that are central to understanding the subject. Um, white lash, this term was coined by American journalist Van Jones um, to express how the election of President Donald Trump was partly a reaction to racial progress. And in my presentation, my definition of white lash is the negative reaction by white society to black presence, whether that be physical or imaginary. And um, the, two, the two categories I'll be discussing of white lash behavior are purposeful displacement and dehumanization. And then the second um, important terminology for this presentation is um, black. So the term black is, um, you know, complicated and contentious, especially in Europe, um, who, you know, who is considered Black and who is not. But in this presentation, I refer to Black people as those of African descent, those who are racialized as Black and or self-identify in that way. And my meaning of African descent aligns with that of the United Nations. And the Black population in Europe today is about 15 million, but because of the lack of data collection, this isn't a precise number. Next slide. So to illustrate this subject, I will give a very, very brief overview um, of longstanding presence of blackness in Europe, and then as well, and then I will mirror historical examples of white lash behavior to the contemporary, and then give an overview of other contemporary forms of anti-blackness. Next slide. So contrary to the whitewash narrative and memory of European history, there's a longstanding presence of blackness in Europe from ancient times leading up through the Renaissance, continuing to the 18th and 19th centuries before the most recent waves of immigration. And this was touched on um, by Dr. Lane as well. Uh, so, I'm going to briefly highlight this history um, to build a foundation for us in my presentation. And due to time constraints, I'm just going to provide this basis through, you know, visuals. So you can, you know, take a few seconds to look at the picture to, you know, just understand how Black people existed in Europe before the 1900s. So, yeah. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So with the basic understanding of how there is a long established history of black people in Europe, I'm next gonna delve into um, the purpose, purposeful displacement form of white lash behavior. Next slide. So the first example I'm going to discuss is Queen Elizabeth I's expulsion of 
what she calls the Black Amours. So Queen Elizabeth I, despite having a Black maidservant and Black um, musicians in her court, authorized the deportation of Black people from England in both 1596 and 1601, according to the UK's National Archives. In 1596, she published two orders within a week of each other. Um, the first uh, letter was to the mayor of London and other officials in England and said that, this is a quote, her majesty understanding that there are, there are of late diverse black amours brought into the realm of which kind of people there are already here too many her majesty's pleasure, therefore, is that those kind of people should be sent forth of the land. And at the end of the letter, she directs the deportation of a specific group of Blackamores of 10 people. And in the second um, decree in 1596 uh, authorized for the deportation of 89 Blackamores um, to be deported to Spain and Portugal. Um, for what she calls a very good exchange. Um, for the UK subjects that were detained in Spain and Portugal, but had since been returned to um, England. Uh, the scholar Emily Bartles argues that the expulsion um, was a nationalistic cause and also was a solution um, to the imminent crisis of the Anglo-Spanish conflict. And the final decree in 1601, um, others the black population, differentiating them from other English people by referring one when she refers to them as her own nat natural subjects, um, and also by characterizing um, the black population as um, you know non non Christian, which others them from you know, other English because it was a Protestant society. In addition, the Crown utilizes the Black group um, as a convenient scapegoat for the terrible financial crisis of the time, um, according to the National Archives. Okay, next slide. So the aforementioned um, 16th century attempt to displace black people mirrors the contemporary mistreatment of the Windrush generation. So the Windrush generation is a namesake to refer to the people who came to the UK from Commonwealth countries, well, colonies um, after the Second World War and before 1973 um, to fill the labor shortage and rebuild the mother country. These crown subjects mostly from the Caribbean had the right to live and work um, in the UK, but there was a lack of monitoring on, behalf, on the part of the government. So some people would come um, on shared passports. There wasn't a use of visas or any type of other documentation. And this became a problem when the UK began to impose stronger immigration measures, um, which uh, is, was, is called um, a hostile environment. And with this, these policies, other entities such as um, their healthcare system, landlords and banks began to enforce immigration, um, which, um, and because some of the women Russian generation were unable to validate their legal status um, because of the lack of documentation, um, a lot of the, the, these Black Brits lost their homes, their jobs, you know, their health care, pensions, access to Social Security, and some also were detained and uh, deported from the UK, even though the UK was their only home. And this crisis is known as the Windrush scandal. And to close this slide, I'd like to read um, a short excerpt from a poem um, about this generation. Remember, you called, you called, remember it was us who came. Next slide. So um, Dr. Lane uh, pretty much described um, during Hitler's Germany, um, the mistreatment of the black population there um, and the occupation of the Rhine after World War 
one by black soldiers. Um, the, the children conceived by the black soldiers and them um, being on the receiving end of derogatory terms. Um, the eugenics movement leading to forced sterilization um, as well as some black people dying in labor and concentration camps. And this anti-black sentiment uh, mirrors to, to a, a less systemic degree to contemporary Germany. So black organizers via the Africa Council uh, circulated brochures for those of African and Asian descent to use so that they can stay safe and avoid what they consider no-go zones in Germany. And there is a need for measures such as this because there's a risk of targeted attacks against the black population. Um, and this is according to activist Tahir Della, who is a member of the Initiative Schwartz mentioned in Deutschland. In addition, a story by the Minority Rights Group International states that um, a part of these targeted attacks and this violence is um, a result of uh, neo-Nazi and other extremist groups. Okay, the second um, form of white lash behavior is dehumanization. Next slide. So, the historical example here um, is um, with Sarah Bartman. So Europe has a enduring and inappropriate um, fascination with the black body, notably that of black women. And this sentiment has contributed to the hypersexualization of black women under the white European gaze, um, where they're not an individual, but they are an object, a vessel um, for white male pleasure. And this is exemplified in the 19th century when um, African women who quote unquote had the right physical characteristics um, for the job. So large breasts, buttocks and what they called pre-evolutionary genitalia were captured and brought to Europe to be displayed. One of the most documented of, of these people, um, Sarah Bartman and she was a member of the Khoi Khoi people. And in 1810, after a tumultuous life, she, uh, she journeyed to London uh, and was coerced to exhibit herself in, uh, in you know, a show, a freak show and for science. Uh, she performed in England and eventually in France. Uh, and she was treated like an animal and prodded, etc. And while she was in Paris, a scientist, George Cuvier, wanted to study her body. Um, and I want to highlight that she insisted on her bodily autonomy and refused to display her genitalia to the public. But unfortunately, when she died in 1815, uh, Cuvier violently dissect dissected her body and um, she was put on display her breasts, her brain, and her genitalia at Musée de Lhomme in Paris until um, 1985. And it wasn't until 2002 when she, she was, her remains were um, returned to South Africa for her to be buried. Okay. Uh, so her treat, the, the treatment of, of Sarah Bartman and the other women of this time uh, represents the uh, underlying association between black womanhood and hypersexuality under the white gaze. And this is um, articulated by Rosetta E. Ross, who writes, used both to satisfy white male libidos and to justify black inferiority, Bartman was viewed and treated as the model black whore slash Jezebel character, which is understood as sexually deviant and as chronically promiscuous. Next slide. And this dehumanization of black women continues to the contemporary, often manifesting in the form of street harassment um, because black women are often assumed to be prostitutes, especially when they're alone. So this is experienced by residents and, uh, and tourists 
Um, but I'm gonna highlight the stories of two, resi two um, residents, both in Italy. So Esperanza Hakuizima, Hakuizimana Rapanti, um, Rwandan born, but adopted by Italians, um, shared um, this, this quote that you can read on the screen about how as starting as early as 11, men would assume she was a prostitute asking her how much, um, which was very traumatic for her, obviously. And in addition to just verbal harassment, there's also physical harassment. This photo here um, is of Daisy um, Osaku, who is an Italian citizen and athlete. And uh, she was driving home when, or she was, she was on her way home when um, a car of Italian men egged her and um, broke her cornea of her eye. And she felt it was a racially motivated attack and that they thought they could get away with it because she was black and they thought she, or she was black or a prostitute. Next slide. So in addition to um, the, the discussed above, um, just very brief, uh, share some statistics of other instances of anti-Blackness today. Um, quickly, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, I'm kind of at the end of my time. Um, but, you know, racial violence is, is pretty high um, in Europe, moderately high in Europe. And um, these are two statistics um, in Austria, one out of seven experienced physical attacks in the public space. Um, and in Finland, 14% um, felt they um, experienced racist violence. Next slide. Other instances of anti-Blackness in both housing and in the workforce in Lithuania, one out of five um, of the respondents said that they would not wanna work with Black people. And in Germany, 33% um, um, felt that they'd been racially discriminated against in access to housing. Next slide. And this is, you know, a list of, um, of some of the many organizations in Europe that um, have really spread awareness of and are pushing for positive change in their communities. So I just wanted to highlight those. And then next slide. So uh, in conclusion, white backlash to black bodies is a crisis rooted in history and extends to contemporary. Um, current European pushback to black population should not be surprising because history has already hinted at what um, can happen. We must embrace that historicity as a tool to understand and counter oppressive behavior. Um, and I would like to end with this quote. Um, so in acknowledging the pain experienced by those of African descent in Europe over time and the enduring leg legacy. Um, this is a quote I'd like to conclude by Michael Plitnik, who defined justice as creating a present and future that allows everyone to live with the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Callan. Um, it was really good to see kind of like a whole European context all put together in one presentation. And because we are short on time, I wanna go ahead and switch right over to Emma, and I will go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint. Okay, uh, good morning, or in my case, afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Center for European Studies for blessing us with such an enlightening meeting, virtual one, uh, so as to discuss all those interesting uh, topics. Um, so, well, uh, we all use some kind of encryption software or a password so as to protect an online account, just as we use our curtains or blinds at windows at home. Why? Because we care about our privacy, the idea that people don't care about their privacy because they have nothing to hide or they haven't done anything, anything wrong or illegal is actually a myth. It's a common fact that we wouldn't want to publicly share on the internet for the world to see all our medical records or our search histories from our phones and computers. So would you give your consent to the government to put a chip in your brain 
and transmit all your thoughts to a centralized uh, computer? Of course you wouldn't. These are all indicators that we still value the notion of privacy, but we have a vague idea of it and why it matters. Uh, it doesn't have to do with secrecy, but more about control. And we are in control over how our personal information is shared and used. Typically, these technologies that advance privacy also advance our safety. Uh, could you please change uh, the slide? And the next one. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and the next one. <laughs> Okay, uh, however, for example, dragnet surveillance doesn't. Recently, uh, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, these guys uh, over there in the slide, have taken on the task to examine the post 9th 11th uh, government surveillance programs, the dragnet surveillance programs, as they are called, and they couldn't find a single example of that surveillance programs advancing any safety as they didn't identify or stop any terrorist attack. This information was only used by NSA, the National Security Agency, to spy on their interests. Next slide. And the next one. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, on another note, millions of people are adopting the so-called smart home devices, which are basically internet connected surveillance cameras. You can control everything, how everything works in your house through your smartphone device, as you can see in the slide. And uh, as we all know, any technology connected to the internet is prone to be hacked. And we can also imagine the dangerous effects of that. Uh, so next slide. Uh, Privacy is not the enemy of safety. It actually works as an insurance of safety. However, today we are bombarded by propaganda stating that we as a humankind need to give up on our privacy in order to ensure safety through surveillance programs. So face surveillance, next slide, uh, is uh, the most dangerous of these technologies and it can be used by governments in two ways. The first way is the face, re face recognition, the identification of someone in an image. And the second one is the face surveillance with surveillance camera networks and databases, which is the creation of uh, re records of all people's uh, public movements, habits, and meetings. Uh, next slide. So um, a digital panopticon is created. Uh, imagine uh, a prison decide to allow a few guards in the center to monitor everything happening around uh, the perimeter in the cells. People cannot see inside the guard tower, but the guards can see into every inch of those cells. Uh, the idea is that if people in those prison cells know they're being watched all the time, they behave themselves accordingly. Uh, face surveillance enables the centralized authority, the state, to monitor the totality of human movement and association in public sphere. Uh, in this case, uh, it's not a guarding in a tower, but rather a police analyst in a spy center, and the prison expands beyond its walls, encompassing everyone, everywhere, all the time. Uh, because who controls the past, controls the future, and who controls the present, controls the past, as uh, George Orwell eloquently states in his uh, famous book, uh, 1984. Next slide. Um, even the technology industry is aware of a problem. Uh, Microsoft president, Brand Smith, has called the Congress to intervene. Uh, yeah, this is Brand Smith uh, in the Congress, as you can see in the slide. And in his uh, opening statement, he pointed out uh, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, ECPA, is one of the critical laws uh, governing digital privacy. When U.S. House Representative passed that bill by voice vote on June uh, 23rd, uh, 1986, uh, Ronald Reagan was president, Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House, and Mark Zuckerberg was only two years old. Obviously, technology has come a long way in the last 30 years. Next slide. Uh, Google, for its part, has publicly declined to ship a face surveillance product because of civil rights concerns. You can read a part of Google's statement in the slides. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the next slide too. Uh, of course, you can find the rest of it under the title, our approach to face recognition, face related technologies can be useful for people in societies. And it's important these technologies are developed thoughtfully and responsibly. But overall, uh, why can't we regulate that? Why the alarm? Uh, 
next slide. Uh, <laughs> face surveillance is dangerous for two main reasons. A, the nature of technology itself, and B, the fact that our systems lack the oversight and accountability mechanism necessary to ensure it wouldn't be abused in government's hands. Eventually, this kind of totalizing mass surveillance fundamentally threatens what it means to live in a liberal society, as we can see in the next slide. Uh, our freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom of press, our privacies, our rights to be left alone. And the question arises, can we, uh, how can we meaningfully regulate this technology? Next slide, please. Uh, and the next one, and the next one. Yeah, okay. Uh, in European Union, uh, the use of facial recognition technology constitutes an interference with the right of data protection as set out in Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, and the right to public, uh, pub, uh, private life uh, under the Article 7 of the Charter. Any limitation of fundamental rights must be necessary and proportionate according to Article 52 of the Charter. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next one. Okay, um, more specifically in secondary law, in law enforcement directive and in general data protection regulation. Uh, these are articles uh, four and five, as you can read them in the slides. Uh, the processing of facial images must be lawful, fair, transparent, must follow a specific, explicit, and uh, legitimate purpose, clearly defined by the member state or the union law, and must comply with the requirements of data minimization, data accuracy, storage, limitation, data security, and accountability. However, uh, today's reality is characterized as complex, plural, volatile, and limits and possibilities are tested all the time. As a result, uh, there are gaps in the current legal framework of uh, European Union, and this framework doesn't afford sufficient uh, protection. In order to overcome this lack of transparency and to meet the enforcement challenges, uh, researchers uh, recommend different measures. Next slide, please. Uh, next one, uh, two. Yeah, okay. Um, indeed, in um, February 2020, uh, the European Commission published a white paper of artificial, on artificial intelligence, proposing to identify the sp uh, specific circumstances, if any, which might justify such use, uh, as well as common safeguards. The European Parliament has called for limits to the use of facial recognition in the European Union, as it bears risks for fundamental rights. Uh, and invited the Commission to consider a moratorium of the use of this uh, face recognition system in the public places and a moratorium on the development of face recognition systems uh, for the law enforcement until technical standards can be considered fundamental uh, rights compliant. Uh, it has also recommended banning uh, face recognition for educational and cultural purposes unless it is exceptionally allowed by law. Next slide. Uh, in April 2021, uh, the European Commission unveiled a new proposal on the European Union regulatory framework on artificial intelligence, according to which different uh, requirements and uh, obligations are needed based on a rich based approach. Um, certain particularly harmful artificial intelligence uh, practices are prohibited under the Article 5 as they are considered threats to people's li safety, livelihoods, and rights. Uh, this includes a uh, system designed to manipulate human behavior through subliminal te te techniques and uh, social scoring by uh, governments, of course. Uh, additionally, uh, the other artificial intelligence system are categorized. Uh, firstly, high-risk artificial intelligence system, which includes technology used in critical infrastructure, such as transport, um, educational and vocational training, uh, employment, essential private and public uh, services, uh, law enforcement, migration, asylum and border control management, administration of justice and democratic processes. These will need to undergo a conformity assessment uh, before being placed on the market and comply with a, a range of safety requirements, uh, such as uh, risk management, uh, such as human oversight, the data governance. In addition, an ex post market surveillance and supervision has to be put in place so as to ensure compliance uh, with the obligation requirements uh, for all high uh, risk artificial intelligence systems. Secondly, limited risk artificial intelligence that would be subject to a limited set of obligations, for example, transparency, 
And thirdly, uh, minimal risk artificial intelligence uh, that could be developed in uh, and used in the European Union without any actual additional uh, legal obligations other than the existing legislation. Thus, a large number of facial recognition uh, technologies are considered high risk system and would be prohibited or need to comply with uh, strict requirements. For instance, uh, the use of real time uh, facial recognition systems uh, in publicly uh, accessible places uh, for the purpose of law enforcement would be prohibited unless member states choose to authorize them for important public security reasons and that appropriate judicial and administrative authorization are granted. While EU makers uh, are beginning to assess uh, the Artificial Intelligence Draft Act, critics question certain aspects of the proposal, including the distinction between high risk and low risk system and the lack of proper public oversight over the proposed self-assessment uh, processes. Some even strongly support stricter rules, including the an, uh, or outright uh, ban on uh, uh, these technologies. Uh, however, technology exists and it will be deployed in every context by every government everywhere. And that's a fact no one can deny. Uh, so the narrative go, but we should refuse that narrative and we should shape our collective future. We should ensure that there are safeguards for morality, for humanism and in general for democratic values. Uh, we are in this driving seat. Thank you.